Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the president of publishing and marketing at Boom Studios. It's Philip Sablik. Thanks for coming on, Philip. Hey, David. Great to be here. So we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about you know, your, your recent visit to Comics Pro's annual meeting over in North Carolina and some of the stuff that came out of that. Uh, but, but before we get in there, I want to start by talking about your background. And one of the things that I, I discovered when I was researching this, which I thought was hilarious, is did you know, this is a, this is a fun fact for you, you were one of the first 10 people I ever interviewed. Fun fact. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people now, but I was looking. Th- I looked at an interview from you uh, that I did with you from uh, 2009, and I was like, "Wow, this has got to be one of my first interviews." And sure enough, you were right off the top. Oh, that's wild! That's wild. I'm, I'm going to have to go back and look at that interview. I wonder how much of it uh, holds up and, and rings true. Please don't. It was it was back in your top cow days, and I was not the best interviewer at that point. <laughs> well, I probably was not the best interviewee. So, uh, we'll we'll give ourselves both a pass. Well, well, I want to actually start with with something I picked up out of that interview, which I think is a really fascinating place to start for anybody in comics. Everybody has their own breaking in story. As the president of publisher and marketing, you know, you could have started any number of places, but you started in comics at Diamond Comic Distributors in customer service. How did, uh, so how did that come together and why did you want to work in comics? Uh, well, I, I think the answer to the second question uh, is uh, pretty easy. I, I wanted to get into comics, I think, for the same reason many of us do when we're, um, you know, preteens and teens, which is I, I wanted to make them. Um, and um, I went to art school. I, I spent most of my high school years um, working on samples for Marvel and DC and doing sample pages and turning them in. Um, and, and, uh, that led to art school, which eventually led to me, uh, staring down the barrel of my, uh, graduation, uh, my senior year and realizing that, um, I didn't have any life skills that might apply to, to, a, to a, 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 a viable, uh, line of work. Uh, I, I had, you know, I, I had that moment uh, in senior year where I was looking around and realizing that uh, out of the, let's say, 20 or 30 people that were in my illustration class, my graduating illustration class, that there were uh, five people that were absolutely phenomenal and amazing artists and were undoubtedly going to go on to long, successful careers as, as professional artists. There were probably five other people, uh, on the other end of the spectrum that maybe had wasted their parents' money, uh, on, on, uh, 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 <laughs> a BFA, um, at, at a private school. Um, and then there was, uh, the, the other 10, which were right in the middle. And I looked around, and I realized I was right in the middle. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, um, I felt like my two options were either move to New York city uh, live on ramen and Kool-Aid for the next X number of years, X being an indeterminate amount, and and take my portfolio around and try to break in as uh, my my original hope was as a comic book penciler. And, and through college, I had grown to have a love of illustration. So I thought maybe editorial illustration was a pathway as well. And the other option was to go get a nine to five job and kind of take a safer, safer path. And what led me to diamond was I felt like if I could get my foot in the door in the industry and begin networking, I was, I was actually more confident in my ability to, um, build relationships and, uh, uh, network within the industry than I was to just go in blind and, and get jobs based off of the, the strength of my artwork. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, Diamond might be a good pathway to that. The way, the way that I discovered diamond was hilarious because this was in, um, 2000 this was early 2000 and so nascent days of the internet and i was sitting at my computer and and i literally did a search for um you know jobs and comic books or something like that and um i had never realized i was i was going to school in baltimore maryland i had never realized that diamond was based just outside of baltimore in one of the suburbs 
and uh, and there was a job posting for customer service. Um, and I, I had waited tables and thought, well, I'm qualified for customer service. I've been doing customer service for, since I was a teenager mm -hmm. <laughs> at, at restaurants. And I love comics, and this might be a way to get in. And so that was that was about the extent of it. That's why uh, that's why I started there. And, and like many other folks, you know, once you begin a career, um, uh, a, a variety of opportunities and possibilities open up to you that you never could have imagined from your perspective as a student. Yeah. Do you feel like that time with Diamond? I know you worked in customer service, and I did you move into sales from there? I moved up to purchasing, which is essentially the uh, division of Diamond that interacts with publishers. So okay. Do you feel like that time with Diamond provided you a unique insight into, I don't know, the world the world you were going to be going into when you went to Top Cow and now over at Boom? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's – customer service at Diamond was as close to a 101 class in the business of comic books as I could have – ever hoped for um you know working with retailers you're, you're really uh seeing things from the ground floor of the industry uh you're talking to the people that are on the front lines of the industry selling the product seeing what they're going through on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis in terms of books not showing up or books showing up damaged or information not getting to them and trying to solve those problems for them and the other thing that was really beneficial for for me and i feel really lucky to have been there at that time is it was really uh, at the stage where the industry was shifting over from largely uh, phone calls and fax and faxes to phone calls, emails, and some faxes, right? So if I had started a diamond customer service five years later, um, I don't know that I would have had the same experience because ultimately at that point, the uh, Diamond website, their, their online tools would have been robust enough to where I probably would have been fielding fewer phone calls. But I was able, because we were still in that transition point, you know, the 125, 150 retailers that I worked with that were my direct accounts, I was talking to on a on a weekly basis, in some cases on a daily basis, really had an understanding and a relationship with them um, that I think's proven to be invaluable. And then that in turn helped inform uh, the my my recommendations and my choices uh, when I was working with publishers and how I advised them because I had that experience of seeing what how retailers responded to different things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in turn, you know, all, it all becomes kind of a, a, a piece of a larger puzzle. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I, I often joke that, um, with my friends who are retailers that, uh, I have had the good fortune to work in virtually every kind of key aspect of the business. I've worked, uh, on the distribution side, I've worked uh, as a creator, I've worked as a, a publisher and, and various facets of publishing. I have never been paid to work in retail. Um, and that is because uh, the comic shop owners in uh, my hometown of Roanoke, Virginia, were uh, smart enough not to hire me when I was uh, <laughs> when I was an irresponsible teenager. Um, so that's the one the one piece of the, the, the one facet of the industry that I can't claim to have any. Uh, long-term kind of formative experience. And um, I've certainly gone to stores and, you know, put in a day behind the cash register, but it's a different experience when you're with a publisher than it would if, uh, if I had uh, done it early in my career. Your local comic shop really missed out because I feel like most comic shops appreciate employees who are huge comic fans because then your paycheck just goes directly back into the business when you're a teenager. That's, that was Absolutely my experience. Weird. Yes, it totally would have. Yeah, I think I think that my my paycheck went to comic books anyway. It was just <laughs> the paycheck from uh, from the pizza place in my hometown as opposed to the comic shop. I gotcha. So I, I want to now we're going to talk about Boom and your your current role as as president of publishing and marketing. What you know that that is a very broad sounding job because you know publishing is is the you know I assume like the world of like you know, driving the varying lines, like overseeing the umbrella of the actual publishing of it. But then marketing is is making sure that those books are being sold, speaking to those varying partners, et cetera, et cetera. 
those seem like complementary, but also like two hugely different realms. What exactly does your role as president of publishing and marketing entail? <laughs> well, I'll try to give you an explanation. I don't know that I've, I've ever been able to give a satisf- satisfying explanation to my in-laws. Um, I'm not sure that they uh, still to this day understand what I do. And I've uh, been married to my wife for over 10 years now. So um, let's see if I can do better with you. But uh, the way that I generally explain it is that the company was started by Ross, uh, Ross Ritchie, um, who's our CEO. And then underneath Ross, there is uh, myself, uh, our editor in chief, Matt Gagnon, and then our CFO, Joy Hoffman. And uh, so the CFO is pretty easy to define. Uh, That is, you know, all of the financial issues within the company fall under her purview. Uh, The editor in chief also similarly easy to define basically everything that is related to the generation of the content that the company does falls under Matt's purview. And then everything else by default falls under my purview. (laughs) So um, usually when we're giving a tour of the office, I say, well, that that side of the office is content generation. And then my side of the office is everything that has to happen before we start creating a project and, and actually generating the material and everything that happens after. Mm. So um, that includes, on the, on the front end, it includes developing the publishing plan and our, our overall publishing strategy, working with uh, um, Matt and, and Joy to create our, our budgets and, and you know, our, our plan every year, um, as well as uh, negotiating and, and um, uh, working with both our licensing partners and creators uh, on contracts. So that's kind of before anything happens, that's where I get involved is uh, I'm involved in the contract negotiation and planning. And then after the material is generated, the departments that I oversee are responsible for printing and distribution and marketing and sales. And so everything downstream. So basically, it's like the publishing side is everything about the comics besides the actual content of the comics themselves. Right. Okay. That's, that's right. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Well, and, and now for another umbrella question. I, I I always find that, you know, you're, you're always seeing new publishers come out. And, and one of the questions I always ask myself is, like, what is their fit? Like, what is their niche in the industry? Like, you always know things like, this is what Marvel and DC do. This is what Image does, et cetera, et cetera. How would you describe what where boom fits in the overall comic industry? What, what is its niche? Yeah. If, the, and, if there's a and, niche. And I think on some level you're asking, why does boom exist? To right? a degree, why, I, I guess. Right. Cause we know, we, we understand why Marvel and DC exist. And, and I think we understand why a company like image exists and they have a very clear kind of um, message and a purpose for being. And, at the, at the core of it, I think the way that I would answer that question um, is I think the Ross as the founder of Boom and the people here at Boom are driven by the idea of um, creating new comic book readers or, or reaching out to new comic book readers. Um, and so, you know, at the heart of it, everybody here believes that comics are a medium. They are. Uh, and like any other form of entertainment, any other creative medium, there are comics out there for everyone. And so we try to do our best to service as many of those people as we can um, and in whatever way we happen to be passionate about, um, at, depending on the makeup of the team at the moment. Um, and so that's why when you look at Boom, you see a company that uh, was – you know, first in the direct market to really pursue comics for kids with, with the Disney comics and our Kaboom line, uh, you know, first in, in the direct market to pursue uh, comics that were aimed predominantly at female readers. Um, you know, we, we go after uh, folks that like uh, elevated presentation and stories and kind of more um, uh, nuanced storytelling with with our RK imprint and then studios is really kind of our, because it's our core imprint is the, the biggest tent mm-hmm. um, and, and has kind of the, the, the widest audience there. But really 
what it all comes back to when I look at it um, is everything that we do is driven from a place of passion, both for us and for the creative people that are working on it. And also with an eye towards how is this going to expand uh, the audience for comic books? Mm hmm. I do think that uh, an interesting wrinkle in what you're talking about, too, is is well, I think one of the first books I ever bought from Boom was the 28 Days Later book, which uh, a lot of people forget was like pretty much the la launching ground for Declan Shelby, who is now a very big artist. And, and, and the interesting thing about that book was licensed books. In, I think a lot of times people think about licensed books in like almost a Scarlet Letter sort of way, where it's just like this is just a thing they're just trying to capitalize on. But Scarlet, or, but but uh, licensed books are interesting because they can attract new readers to comics who have not really experienced them before. Like you guys do, uh, I'm trying to remember which one which ones you do that the the big uh, animated series ones. Um, well, we, you know, we've been working with Cartoon Network right. for many years. So like Adventure Time and Steven Universe, right, right. Have these massive, passionate audiences that feel like if you were to draw a Venn diagram would be very open and receptive to the idea of reading comic books, but maybe have never read one because they don't, they didn't think that there was one out there for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I think that is what drives our, uh, licensed publishing programs is looking at this through the lens of historically within comics, licensed comics have been, you know, frankly, kind of a, a, um, a quick way to, to make a buck. And you kind of look at a, a big franchise and you go, well, I can, I can come in here and, and sell a bunch of comics to the existing fans of whatever property it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to use our own properties just so that I don't inadvertently pick on anybody, anybody else. But like, you know, if, if we were coming in and looking at Power Rangers and going like, well, there's like X number of Power Rangers fan out fans out there. And if we put out our Power Rangers comic, we can, we can generate some nice revenue for the company and move on. Um, but the way that we've always chose to approach it and something that really attracted me to boom was this idea that the opportunity is not to make a few dollars off the existing Power Rangers fan, the opportunity is to reach out to that fan of this franchise and say, look, we are going to be additive to your experience and we're going to tell stories that you've been yearning for and that are going to bring you joy and excitement. And in the process of that, we're going to open you up to the idea that there are other stories within this medium of comic books that might be equally as exciting to you. And, um, and the way that I've always looked at it is like a bad like the licensed comic is an opportunity to be someone's first introduction into the medium of comics. And if you don't pour as much energy and passion into it as you do your original work, then it could very well be their last mm -hmm. interaction with comics, you know, and they, they look at it and go, well, comics aren't very good. And as, as a rule, because I picked up this power Rangers comic and it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've always uh, really, pursued this line of thinking of how can we add to the franchises that, you know, we've been entrusted with, how can we be good shepherds of them and, and tell stories that are exciting, uh, to us and that hopefully can create additional fans of the medium. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's, it's really interesting from a marketing standpoint too, because it's easy to connect the dots from something like adventure time where the, the person, the origins of that person might be as an animation fan to something like Lumberjanes now, where you can say, hey, the person who made She-Ra, Princess of Power, uh, is the person who created co-created this comic. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's, that's an amazing, compelling marketing message that is an easy jump from one licensed property to a, I believe, creator-owned property. And that, that's, a, that's a heck of a message. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the face of it, the company is difficult to define, you know, and I, I joked when I first got here, the challenge for me uh, as the person that was stepping into the marketing role is what is the Venn diagram of Peanuts fans and Hellraiser fans, uh, which which was, were both, you know, big, big initiatives for us in 2012 when I when I joined the company. And the reality is that that overlap is probably pretty small. But I think the opportunity to create new comic book readers through each of those franchises is pretty exciting. And then when you, you know, 
buttress that with other new original content that um, can appeal to those to those fans. It's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things about the way that you you all have approached it is that you have defined lines like imprints like Kaboom and Boombox and things of that sort. And it's kind of funny because I remember, I mean, not that anybody said anything bad about them, but it, it, it was not really a thing that publishers did outside of like image initially when there was like shadow line and Wildstorm and all the stuff like that those were defined by creators those weren't defined by target markets or like levels of age groups and stuff like that but it's funny because now you see even publishers like dc doing it with like ink and zoom like those are things that you kind of you, boom as a whole was kind of on a few years even before the, the i guess the big guns so to speak yeah i think i think so i mean I, you know giving dc credit i uh, you when i was when i was growing up and reading dc comics you know they had vertigo and eventually there was the right. helix comics and in some ways i think that you know success in these things is about luck and timing as much as it is a good idea mm -hmm. um you know i look at an imprint like minx at dc and go like that's an idea the idea to go and do outreach to uh, women who are readers and try to pull them into graphic novels uh, is a terrific idea. And, and Boombox is, is a manifestation of that. Um, Minx may have just been too early. You mm -hmm. know? So um, I don't know that we can take full credit for it <laughs> right. as, much as, as much as I'd love to and appreciate you giving us that credit. But I do think that what we have been successful in doing is um, looking at the market and looking at what the opportunities are and saying, you know what, now's the right time to step into kids comics or now's the right time to step into comics for women or now's the right time to do this, that, or the other thing. And, and I think that is something that we are good at being on, on the, on the vanguard of, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and looking at it and going, okay, now's, now's that moment. And sometimes it, it takes a couple of years to catch, you know, um, kaboom, uh, really didn't hit its tipping point until adventure time, which was, you know, we had been publishing kids comics for three years at that point, mm -hmm. um, or two and a half years, something like that. So, uh, and if you look at Boombox, uh, you know, it, it evolved as an imprint, the, you know, first handful of titles that we released from that imprint, um, didn't connect as well as Lumberjanes, which was probably the fourth or fifth title that we released from that imprint. And then that helped shape the, uh, what the imprint would become. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think being open to listening to what your readers and what the market is telling you is, is part of making those things successful is not, you know, being willing to kind of update your hypothesis as, as you go along. Right. Yeah, I always say, like, you know, when, when I'm researching a big article or something like that, it's like, you can never go into these situations having your mind made up that you know the answer already. And it seems to me that part of what you, you've all been doing is, it, it seems like you guys have been making more of a shift towards uh, younger audiences, uh, women, you know, underserved audiences. Is Is that what the market has been largely dictating to you or is, is that partially as defined by like the, the content section of the business? Um, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, I think, uh, you know, we, we're able to do the content we do because of the team that we've assembled. So you don't get lumberjanes if you don't have Shannon waters sitting in that editor's seat, because lumberjanes is very much a reflection of the things that, Shannon was passionate and excited about. And, um, the, the market piece of it is more our team being able to look and say, well, we're seeing trends that say that, um, you know, there are more and more women coming into comic shops and we see it even more, um, uh, more broadly in, at, at conventions. And we see it, in uh, bookstores. And so then you start to look and, and think about, well, why is that? And you, you start looking back and going, oh, okay, well, that's right. You know, six years ago, 
we had this giant manga explosion. Oh, the readers of manga were predominantly female. Okay, so that you know that that has to have a ripple effect down down the road. And so um, I think that you know on some level it's 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 never one thing. You mm-hmm. know that's the tough thing about when you look back on it. I think it's it's easy to kind of try to pinpoint like oh well there was this moment where we sat down we looked around we said here's the answer Mm -hmm. and the reality of it is that it's a it's a fair amount of trial and error it it is uh driven in large part by um what the staff and what the creators are passionate about um and then it's a matter of looking around and trying to see are there market trends to back it up um I don't know if that answers your, oh, your question. It, it, it does. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually just gen- generally curious as like, what markets are you seeing growth in? Is is there a specific, are there specific areas and formats that seem to be doing particularly well for Boom these days? Uh, absolutely. And I, and I don't think any of this is going to be like necessarily new information, but, sure. uh, but, uh, but we, you know, we've, what we've seen is we've seen a steady growth in um in the graphic novel format certainly over the the last five plus years um i think and and specifically in uh kids and and female readers and that's where like our kaboom and boombox imprints have been the the, had the strongest growth in sectors that are aimed at those audiences and, and aimed at the graphic novel format so that you know, that would include chain book retail and ebook retail, and in particular, you know, libraries and independent bookstores um, have been really receptive. And some of that is, um, it's a combination of the creators being excited and interested in telling those kinds of stories, our team being interested and passionate about getting those stories to market. And then on the buyer end, you know, the, uh, you know, taking, for example, um, librarians, when I first started, uh, in the business and I went to my first American library association, you know, at at that time I was with diamond, but I could see, you know, librarians would come through the diamond books aisle and, uh, see the graphic novels on the table, ask what it was. And you would tell them it was a graphic novel and you could tell that, that was uh, a, a negative in their in their mind and in their experience that it wasn't real literature that it wasn't something that belonged in a library. Now, fast forward to two thousand, you know, thirteen, where we had the first issue of Lumberjanes at Boom at ALA, and we had a, a all we had was one issue and a backdrop of Lumberjanes with the art on it, and we had lines of librarians coming up to us asking us about Lumberjanes because what had happened in those probably 10 years from, you know, the, t- the first time I was at an American library association conference to then was the previous generation of librarians had started to retire and the new generation of librarians coming in were the, the women and men that had grown up reading manga and, reading Oni Press and reading web comics and all these things um, informed their interests and their passions and their perspective on what was valid within that, that market. So that's, that's where the kind of like right time, right place comes in is you have to, sometimes you have to wait for the market to, to catch up to where you think it should be going. Yeah. I do think libraries are a very underrated channel. Like everyone, you know, people, despair over you know what they've read on comicron and you know i don't get me wrong i love comicron and john jackson miller's the man however i mean there there's channels everywhere that are affecting things and and libraries are a huge huge difference maker for a lot of publishers and it, it seems to make sense for the types of books you offer because as you noted there's like a natural extension from from the manga boom there but w- one thing i'm really interested in is Going back to, to to Matt's role as the editor in chief, how much bleed over is there between your role and his role when it comes to finding a way to best serve these audiences? Because 
you know, format is going to dictate a lot of how you market and who you market to. Is is there an intersection there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, it starts in the in the inception point, which is like many publishers, we have an internal pitch meeting and a and a project approval meeting where we're looking at just the creative pitches and. Uh, I have a voice in that. Matt has a voice in that. Our our CEO has a voice in that and a couple other folks. And so from the outset, we're looking at it from two different angles, which is, are we excited about this creatively? And then are we excited about this commercially? Um, and so there are some projects that we do that, you know, frankly, we look at and we go, well, we don't know what the commercial uh, opportunity here is, but everybody in editorial is really excited about this creator and excited about this concept. And so let's just take a flyer on it because there is an element of, um, of, uh, unpredictability about any creative endeavor, you know, and I, um, my, one of my favorite quotes about this is years and years ago, uh, Robert Kirkman did an interview, uh, and it was related to the walking dead and the interviewer, asked him, you know, what is it that you think that, that has made that Walking Dead such a phenomenon? You know, like, why why this zombie thing instead of any number of other zombie things? Why is it a cultural phenomenon? And his answer was really honest, which was, um, hell, I don't know if I, if I knew I'd had ten, I'd have 10 of them. And, <laughs> yeah. and I think that's true. You know, like, that's the, that's the alchemy part of, uh, of creative endeavors is you, you can be really experienced and really smart and really have really great instincts, but ultimately there are too many variables to predict what's going to be successful and what's not. Um, so yeah, so sometimes we'll, we'll look at something and, and, and decide to move forward with and take a chance on it, even if we don't immediately see what the commercial opportunity is. But most of the time we're trying to find projects that we're excited about both aspects of it, both the commercial aspect and the creative aspect. Yeah. And now a word from our sponsor. Yo, everybody. I'd like to take a minute to talk about our sponsors over at Impact Theory Comics. Impact Theory Comics is a new independent publisher, and they're releasing their first comic, Neon Future. Neon Future is a collaboration with world-famous DJ and producer Steve Aoki, and is written by the Eisner Award-winning writer of Justice, Jim Kruger, with artists Neil Edwards of Fantastic Four fame and Jeremy Rapak delivering the visuals and building the world. Want a first look at the book and Neil and Jeremy's art? Give Impact Theory a follow on Instagram at, at ITComics. If you like what you see and you're a fan of science fiction, this might be the comic for you. So head over to your local comic book shop and get Neon Future number one on your poll list ASAP. And now, back to the show. Well, I mean, it is interesting looking at uh, uh, one book that I'm, I'm uh, probably one of the most rabid supporters of, uh, of I would say, is uh, Wild's End. I love that series. Uh, Dan Abner yeah. and, and, and uh, Ian Colbert, are, th- that, that series is phenomenal. And the, the third volume, after it being a single issue, two single issue miniseries, became a trade paperback. And, and I know that that type of thing, or I, I guess technically a graphic novel, that kind of thing is is kind of another column A, column B type situation. It's like you want to finish the story, but it doesn't necessarily work in the single issues market at that point, and you know that. And I, I guess that's that's one of the interesting points where those two sides meet is like, what is the right answer for this book that it seems like you all wanted to support? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly right. And and. I love Wild's End as well. I mean, I think it's a uh, a brilliant project and some of uh, Dan and Ian's best work. And uh, there was a ton of passion here for it. Um, it's but it's a tricky project, right? It's anthropomorphic. It's a period piece. It's uh, you know, it, 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 it's not something that immediately falls into a clean, easy box. And so those projects can be challenging to sell and, and to and to market. And so um, that that's a case where you look at it and you go, well, we want to we want to we want to empower and facilitate these creators being able to finish telling the story that they set out to tell. How do we do that in a way that's both responsible and gives it the best chance for success? And so that was what we did in that case. And and I think in terms of like your earlier question about 
you know, the overlap of format and other elements that, you know, it's interesting as comic publishing has evolved and there are more and more markets available to us as, as possible as possibilities. Um, it has necessitated uh, a deeper level of collaboration here, you know, within the company. So when we were predominantly a direct market single issues publisher, um, which, you know, Matt's been here 11 years, you know, you, you, you look at the first four or five years of the company, of the company's history while he was here and it was single issues and then you collect them into trades and there was like a very, and it was predominantly through comic shops. So you know what the, the needs of the comic shops are and you know what format and you know, you know, these are the things that need to go on a cover and these are the things that, you know, where the UPC should be and all, all these other like smaller elements. And as you broaden the number of places you can put this, uh, place this product in, it requires you to think more strategically about, okay, what is the right trim size for this book? What is, what are the finishing touches? What are the things that should go on the cover that'll help sell it? How do we build all this stuff out so that it is appealing to a library school market as well as a comic shop, as well as um, an independent bookstore? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's a tough you know line to walk. I mean, it is, it is interesting to think about, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of when it started, but I feel like Irredeemable probably started about 10, maybe 11 years ago. And, and that, that was the first monster hit I remember from, from Boom, because that was, that was a big book. I mean, in a lot of ways, it, was, it felt more like a Marvel and DC book than it felt like a Boom book, because it was Mark Wade and, uh, oh my God, I completely forgot. Peter Krauss. Peter Krauss. I'm so sorry, Peter. Um, but anyways, I mean, that, that, was, that was a superhero book. I mean, it was a, a twist on the superhero concept, yep. but it worked, it worked all the same. And now, I mean, I, I do. You, would you as, you know, uh, this isn't your purview, but superheroes probably aren't a huge part of books you look at these days. No, it's not. And, and that's not to say we would never do a superhero book. But part of, you know, you asked earlier why, uh, why, you know, we look at some of these underserved audiences. The superhero audience is pretty well serviced. I feel yeah, like, yeah. yeah, just a little and bit. So it, would, it would have to be a pretty unique and, and spectacular uh, combination of creator and idea for us to um, uh, to do a superhero book. Uh I'm trying to think the last one we've we've done, and I would probably struggle to think about. It. I mean, I guess you could argue that Power Rangers, in a way, is a superhero book. Yeah, um, it's certainly uh, constructed like one. Um, but but in terms of kind of a straightforward, you know, here's guys in in capes with superpowers that uh, uh, in some way relate to the archetypes that we all know and love. Um, I think it would have to be something. Uh, really innovative and disruptive and exciting for us to to jump in on, and and I would argue that that's what irredeemable was. The idea of Mark Wade, who was you know someone that I think most fans would think of as having done very uh, sincere and aspirational uh, superhero stories throughout his career, um, to come in and kind of uh, uh, tell the story of well, what if Superman was suddenly a jerk is, you know, is, 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 is attention getting and it's interesting. And it's a question that, you know, I think when you pose that you're like, Oh yeah, I, I want to know the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, never say never, but I think that it, it's as the company has evolved and grown, it's less and less interesting to us. Mm hmm. So, so let's talk about the the, the big topic that I, I wanted to bring up, and that is in relation to the direct market. Uh, the direct market uh, has been very famously through a series of articles from people like Brian Hibbs, uh, Phil Boyle, uh, Joe Field, um, uh, Chuck Rosansky, et cetera, et cetera. People know that the direct market is having problems, and a lot of it comes down to their relationship with a lot of publishers and some of the publishing practices that are going down. And and knowing that, 
uh, you you and the rest of your team rolled out a new book from a fantastic creative team, uh, Kieran Gillen and Dan Mora, called Once in Future. And, and you know, that that in of itself is a big selling point. You know, obviously, a, a book from those two is, is huge. But you have very aggressive plans that you rolled out in a speech at Comics Pro about its debut in August 2019. I'm going to do a quick spiel walking through all the things you're doing with with direct market retailers just a quick bold list uh every issue will be fully returnable every issue will only have one cover meaning no variance which is a, obviously a big sticking point for a lot of shops uh first issue will have sliding discounts uh f- depending on how much is ordered by the the totality of the direct market uh each following issue will be supported with uh issues on top of the order ensuring support throughout the length of its run and the collection itself will be fully returnable that is massive uh on top of that you're even doing basic i mean the 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 point is is if you if this ends up being a top 25 debut you're going to do it all over again with another book why did you want to do this why did you want to respond to the direct markets uh you know pain points in such a significant way i think on some level because we could um and and i think that you know one of the um great things about the way that the company has evolved is, is one of the things that we're really lucky to have is um, Paul Levitz is in our, is on our board of directors um, and has been for, I think coming up on five years now. And so one of the great kind of <clears throat> unexpected benefits of, of working at boom for me is that every week I hop on the phone and get to bend Paul Levitz's ear for anywhere between 20 minutes to an hour and ask it, pepper him with annoying questions. And, and, and I think one of the byproducts of having that relationship with Paul is Paul always had a, uh, a real sense of kind of responsibility to the direct market and to the industry and to try to balance his goals, uh, as, as the publisher and president of DC with what he thought was best for the market place as a whole and and to make it sustainable and last for a long time. And so I I think there was an element of that all already at boom, but I think having Paul's voice in our ear helps reinforce that. And so, you know, coming to the end of last year from where I sat, it, it was interesting because we had a great year. We were up in the direct market. We actually had, the, the largest market share gain year over year of, of any publisher. Um, we outperformed, you know, the market in general. We, we were, you know, continuing to grow that business. We had a, a, an amazing year in the book market. We had an amazing year in digital. It, it's, it's just been steady growth for us for any number of, of years, pretty much since I've been here and got here in 2012. And so on the one hand, um, looking at it myopically, we don't have any problems with the industry, right? We're, we're doing great and we're growing and we're, and we're really excited about that. On the other hand, I look at the challenges that the industry is facing and go, well, if we just kind of like ignore this, then it's not going to get better. And at a certain point, even if we're the outlier, it is going to impact us as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, we, we, I think had built up a tremendous amount of goodwill from direct market retailers and, and comics pros and organization in particular over the last few years. And it felt like, you know, if we, if we don't take the opportunity to say something and to do something to try to improve the market in general and leverage that goodwill to maybe, um, issue a challenge to the market, then we're, we're being cowards, you know, we're, we're not really, uh, not living up to the ideals I think that, that we hold internally. And so, um, so I looked at that and, and with our team here and we thought, well, what can we do? And the reality is, is that, you know, 83%, 84% of the direct market is controlled by the top five publishers. Those five publishers haven't changed in, you know, 10 plus years. Uh, they're 
general market share and market position has not changed in 10 plus years. So um, there is a limit to what we can do, you know, and uh, as I, as I've, you know, as I said to, to retailers at comics pro when I, when I was chatting with them, you know, as much as I would like to single handedly fix these challenges that you're facing, um, I can't. Um, but what we can do is we can offer up a case study uh, that can act as proof of concept for the marketplace and put something out there that um, you know other publishers could look at and go, well, if we do this or if we do some of this, the market will respond and will support us. Because one of the challenges I think that publishers face is that you know, there are, let's take variant covers as an example. Um, you know, every retailer that I've ever spoken with virtually, um, will tell me that they feel like there's too many variant covers in, in the market and that they're frustrated with it and that it's a drain on their resources and it's, um, not good for the market long term. And yet, uh, those strategies are successful, uh, in the market. And so there's that disconnect of if you're sitting uh, in a publisher seat and you're hearing on the one hand, we don't like this. And on the other hand, those strategies are being supported financially. It makes it difficult to, um, to, to reconcile. And also it makes it tough to not sit there and go, well, if I do what you ask me to do, where's the proof that – ultimately that is still going to be beneficial for me, right? Because we're all in, in any business, we're all here to, with the same objective, which is every retailer wants his store to be more profitable. Every creator would like to make a higher page rate or get better royalties. Every publisher would like to have higher profit and on and on and on. Right. Um, and so our, our hope with once in future was to say, you know what, because we have the ability to do so. And because we're confident um, in, in taking the stand, we're essentially going to try to give retailers everything they've been asking for. And we're going to do it on a project that um, it, that we believe would be a, a successful hit regardless of whether we, we were doing this initiative, right? If we, um, and, and I mentioned in my speech, you know, if, if we if the sole objective here was to make once in future a hit in the direct market, we know how to do that. We know how to do it with a, a smart variant cover strategy and incentive strategy. And we can, you know, uh, do it in any number of ways that don't require all these kind of extra steps. But the point here was here's something that if you're a retailer, you can get behind and uh, the added benefit is hopefully it becomes a case study and a signal to the industry that there's a better way of doing things. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, and it's it's also interesting, too, because I feel like Boom is in a unique position to do something like this relative to your peers, because Marvel and DC, I'm, I'm, let's be perfectly honest, that they are beholden to their own success and the things that have gotten them there. And they're probably unable to do something like this, at least in its current state, without that proof of concept. Image, there's a lot of complications, I'm sure, with with creator-owned projects and getting buy-in and et cetera, et cetera. I think it puts you in a position to be opportunistic about this, you know, to, to do something like this, to to take a, a larger risk. And I don't know. I mean, it, what was what was the response on the floor? How did how did people respond to to this offer? Oh, it was it was fantastic. It was. Um one of the best experiences I've ever had in a room full of retailers, uh, when, you know, we, it's funny because the, the first half of the speech was more about things that boom was going to be doing to improve our, um, our, our guarantee program and things we were just kind of broadly doing that we saw as, as positive steps within the industry. And by the time I, um, I got to the part about once in future, in the speech, I was asking them if they would support something that had every issue returnable, if they would support, you know, a series that had no variant covers. And the fun, unexpected part of this was in the room, uh, 125 retailers were all shouting yes back at me. <laughs> nice. Um, 
And uh, my favorite moment in the room was I had not gotten, I think I had gotten to the collection being returnable and a retailer in the room yelled, what's the book? Mm-hmm. Because he, he, he really wanted to know because he was already excited to support it and, and could see the opportunity here. And, um, so we, we, we had a terrific, you know, time at comics pro. It led to a lot of really great conversations are, you know, what I can tell you is that just based on the, uh, orders that we got from the folks at comics pro based on what percentage of the market they represent, represent, this is, on track to be our biggest original launch. I think it, you know, depending on what else is out in August, I think we're in a good position to get this to launch in the top 25, which would be incredibly unusual for a non-Marvel, non-DC title these days. Um, and even for, you know, launches from, from Image and Dark Horse and IDW, it's, it's really tough to, to get the numbers up there at that point. And to do it with a single cover on the first issue, I think is even a, a more powerful statement. So, I, I was floored. Um, and, and I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest because there was an element of our presentation that was challenging. You know, we were, we wanted to lay out some, uh, uncomfortable truth, uh, about the market and about the signals the market was sending. And there was part of me that said, well, there's, there's always a chance that, um, this is n- not what the retailers will want to hear. This is not, the conversation they're going to want to have at this point, and it could um, get a negative reaction. But every every single retailer I spoke to was elated and uh, incredibly supportive, which was which was really really gratifying. It is kind of funny because your your speech is a uh, operates as an interesting point counterpoint to Brian Hibbs's speech, where he basically asks for all the things you deliver with this. <laughs> <laughs> so that worked out nicely. I, I, I will say that that uh, I was a lot less nervous about this speech once I heard uh, Brian and Joe Field and, and and Phil Boyle give their presentations, which happened probably about an hour before I gave my presentation. Um, so it was nice to see that, you know, our our listening to the market, we were doing it accurately. You know, we were hearing the market accurately and 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 reflecting back to the market. Hey this is what we're hearing and this is what we think we can do as a publisher. But I think it's, you know, it, it it's just the first step, right. you know, because this is not a thing that's going to change overnight. The thing that I look at is two years ago, actually let's rewind the tape. Four years ago, we went to comics pro and we rolled out the, uh, what was, what we then called the boom innovators program, which was a returnability program. Um, and that program uh, was was successful, but not as successful as I would have liked and didn't work as well for our retail partners uh, as I would have liked. So two years ago, we wrapped up that program and rolled out the guarantee program, which we felt like was a better program. It was simpler. It was more straightforward. Um, it, it answered a lot of the uh, feedback that we had gotten from retailers. And now... Two years after that, we we look around and we go, okay. Uh, at some level, IDW, Dark Horse, Image, AfterShock, Valiant. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody else out here. Um, uh, Lion Forge. They all have returnability programs as part of their regular publishing practices, um, and so it takes time for people to see that an idea works and uh, that there's a positive response. And then it takes time to convince other people in in the organization that this is something that needs to be tried. And so um, I think this is the first step of answering the, the challenge and the call that, you know, some of these leaders within the retail community have, have brought to publishers. And in turn, Now our challenge back to retailers is like, okay, great. Now let, you know, you have the power. Ultimately you, you are in control of, of the dollars in the direct market. Mm -hmm. 
I think the thing that really makes this one stand out, because when I was when I was researching for this, I was looking through the previous programs you had or like marketing pushes. You had innovators, you had push comics forward, you had the boom guarantee. And to me, the thing that really makes this one interesting is it's very, uh, I mean, from a marketing standpoint, it's very rare that publishers put so much weight behind one comic and and people can it, it's hard you know for like the boom guarantee it's a uh, no order minimums no order matching no tricks just full returnability is is the, the line and if i remember correctly it's like basically six books a month that offer returnability but for this it's just one book one time let's do this and i think it's easier to activate an audience of retailers when you know it's just one title with a team like that with all these different things being offered. I, th- I think that makes it a lot more actionable in a way that other things have not been necessarily. Yeah, I think I think at that point it becomes a, a, a rallying cry, right. right? which is what we intended it to be, which is this is meant to be a signal. This is meant to be a instrument to send a message to the industry. And it's, it's more powerful if that message is not diffuse in any way, right? If it's very uh, pointed and targeted, right? And my hope is that we get to August and we get the results that you know we're all collectively hoping for, and then it will be on boom to turn back around and go, okay, here's the next series we're going to do it on, and here's the next series. And, and we have to repeat it so that it becomes um, a, a pattern of behavior, right? And at that point, I think it will embolden and empower – uh, folks at other publishers to say, look, this is something that's working. And um, there's a, it, it's in our best interest to not miss out on something that's working. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately that's, you know, all of us are motivated in business by like, well, what, what is this going to, what is the net result to me or to my, to my tribe or to my company? You know, how, how, how's this going to work out? And I think, um, you know, what's, What's really awesome about this particular thing is this is a program that only works if Diamond Comics is behind it. And, you know, you, you asked me earlier, um, you know, what are some of the benefits of having go- come up through Diamond? Well, one of them is, you know, relationships, you know, and, and being able to talk to those people as somebody who has been inside the company and understands, you know, probably less now, 10 years after or no, gosh, more than that, 15 years <laughs> since I was last uh, at, at Diamond. But, um, you know, I have an understanding of kind of what are the things that are pain points for them, where is their flexibility, where, how can we construct a program that is n- not only beneficial for Boom and, and the retailers, but something that is uh, a program that Diamond can support and get behind. So, you know, wouldn't happen without them, um, wouldn't happen without Kieran and Dan, um, being willing to take this leap with us. Right. Right. Um, because, you know, again, you look at the worst case version of this and if we don't do our jobs uh, on the marketing and sales side, um, and there's a bunch of unsold books at retail, we've told them they can, they can return them. Well, that's, that's not good for Kieran and Dan, you know, like ultimately they, you know, their long-term, uh, uh, you know, potential with this series is based on us getting the book in the hands of as many fans as possible. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of people getting behind this and, and taking a collective leap. Um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. I, I was actually going to ask about Kieran and Dan, whether or not they had to have buy-in that that's good that, that they were on board. It, it is, I mean, the interesting thing about it, I, I wrote about it on, on, I have a weekly column on my Patreon, like analyzing like comics news and things like that. And it is, it is a risk, but to me, it's, it's a, it's a calculated risk that has a lot of upside to it. And a lot of that comes down to, uh, you know, what, what Brian, you know, going back to Brian Hibbs's speech at Comics Pro, he was talking about how a lot of what is going on falls back on the retailers themselves. And that's not me pointing fingers. I mean, that's sort of Brian p- pointing fingers, I guess. Uh, but I mean, it comes down to they're voting with their dollars. And like, th- if they want to support good behavior, they have to support good behavior. 
And 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 this to you know I, I'm sounds like to a lot of them is is where they want to move their money towards or like a direction that they they see value in, which is which is great. Yeah, and I think I think at the end of the day, it's easy to understand why if you are a small business owner in uh, I'm just going to say Middle America, right, and you're not in a major city, and you have uh, you're kind of outside looking in you know, Marvel and DC seem gigantic to you and they are, you know, they're part of Disney and, and, and time Warner. Right. So like, uh, uh, you look at that and you go, well, what difference does it make if I don't order X? Right. Right. Um, what message is that going to send? But that's part of what we're trying to reframe is that yes, individually, each one of you may not be able to move a mountain, but you are, you know, there's 2000 of you or 2,500 of you, how many, however many like, uh, direct market comic shops there are. And collectively you are the direct market. You know, you, you are the only ones on some level with true power because you get to decide what is supported and what is not supported. And the, the challenge here is that not supporting something is riskier than supporting something, right? And what I mean by that is if you're in a city that has four comic shops in it or in a larger metropolitan area and you decide you're going to take a principled stance and not support something, the risk you run is that your competitor across town will support it and will take your customers, right? Mm -hmm. But and, And that's why we wanted to come with a activation point that was positive, which is I'm not going to, you know, have, have the audacity to tell you what you should or shouldn't support. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give you this thing that can be an example of something that works the way that you want it to work. And if you support that strongly enough, maybe it will encourage other change, but there's an element of risk with all of it, right? When we, back in 2016, we announced that we were cutting back our line 15% because we felt like there was too much product in the market. There was a world where you know, the market looked at us and said, cool, thanks. We're going to cut our orders by 15% mm-hmm. and, and, and support you less. Now, luckily that didn't happen, you know? And, and so I think anytime you're trying to, um, change things, there is an element of risk that accompanies that, um, that requires a leap of faith, um, and a, and a belief that, you know, there's something better on the other side. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I just have a few more questions, and I did want to ask about something that, I mean, every publisher is facing, but I think it's interesting for Boom in particular. Like, you look at... um you look at DC and what they were doing with the Walmart giants, and that that caused a lot of consternation amongst the direct market populace because that they they viewed things like Tom King Superman, Tom King and uh, ooh, um, God, I don't remember Bendis, who drew, right? ben, no, well, yeah, uh, oh, I was yeah, trying to remember oh. who drew the Superman story, and then Bendis and Nick Darrington doing a Batman story. They view that as basically taking sales from them that that were pretty much guaranteed like bendis and darrington on batman is a slam dunk and yeah. and that and that's one of the, the tricky parts about all this is boom is a company that in particular is courting a lot of different markets because you are dealing with underserved populations that often buy through bookstores uh through library you know they're they're going through libraries they're going through digital they're going through places like that how do you balance serving multiple markets while staying kind of, you know, staying in favor with each of them or at least not losing them completely? Yeah, no, I, th- I think that's a great question. And I think that, you know, you can see, again, like uh, not being inside D.C., I, I don't know the the various forces and kind of pressures they were under in, in constructing that that program. And I, and I would say that, like, um, at the core of it, I, I believe that reaching out to new comic book readers at mass market is if you can, if you can be successful at it, that's a great opportunity, you know, because it's, it's a wider, broader audience. Now it looks like they are, you know, based on uh, Dan DiDio's comments at comics pro. And then afterwards, it looks like they are evolving that program to uh, make it more inclusive of the direct market, make it, 
you know, um, something that is that retailers will view as less directly competitive. And I think that's the trick is how do you continue to broaden the reading audience and broaden the market with without doing it at the expense of of who's already there. Right. right? So the the other day, you know, I was looking at when I forget about when I started in the business, when I started at in publishing, which would have been at Top Cow in like 2006, there were really only two channels to sell comic books. Um, it was the direct market comic shops and there was uh, chain bookstore retail, which mm-hmm. at that point was Barnes and Noble, Borders and uh, Books a Million. And there really wasn't anything else. Like we were trying to get into other places and the, obviously there you know, exceptions to every rule. Um, I'm sure, you know, libraries were carrying mouse, you know, but that didn't right. mean that there was like a marketplace in, in libraries for graphic novels. Right. And now you look at, you look around and I was just doing a tally and you have, you know, comic shops, you have, uh, chain bookstores, you have libraries, you have schools, you have e-retail, you have, um, uh, 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 educational markets, college bookstores, independent bookstores, uh, you have uh, uh, comic book digital apps like Comixology, but then you also have uh, library distribution systems that are digital. You have uh, subscription services. You have mass market like Walmart and Target and Costco, and you have specialty market like Hot Topic and occasionally Urban Outfitters and things like that. So there are all these. It, it's it's there's so many more opportunities to introduce customers and consumers to this medium. And I think the challenge to publishers um, is to look for ways to do that in a way that is complementary. And in in an ideal world, I think you would be reaching, you know, you would have certain projects that reach incredibly wide audiences. And I'll use... Um, Amazon as an example, because I think, uh, as an ecosystem, this makes sense, right? So like, if you like reading books, not comic books, but if you like reading books digitally, the most casual version of that is you're an Amazon prime member and there's some stuff available for free on prime. It's part of your subscription and you get to check it out and you get to sample stuff. And then if you find that you enjoy reading enough to where you've got through all of that, then there's uh, a Kindle subscription membership, right? Mm -hmm. You dive in a little bit deeper or, you know, in the case of comics, maybe you go into like comiXology unlimited, but that doesn't give you everything. So then if you become even more invested in reading, then now you want to have things as they release a la carte. Now you're you're purchasing stuff regularly and you're, you know, you're, you're a super customer. Right. And I think for years, comics as an industry has been built around the super customer, right? Mm -hmm. The person like you and me that goes into their comic shop on Wednesday and, you know, is looking for a new thing to buy and to discover. And you're invested in the medium. Um, But wouldn't it be great if, the market was big enough so that, you know, there was room for customers that liked the medium enough to where maybe they read two or three graphic novels a year, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and some of those folks are going to read two or three graphic novels a year and eventually get hooked enough to where now they're doing it once a month. And eventually maybe they'll do it once a week, you know, like, so it's this kind of concentric circles um, and so I think that's the, that's the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's not an easy riddle to solve. I'm not going to pretend that I have, you know, the ultimate answer to that because I don't think I do. Um, but if you look at our efforts, you know, with brands like WWE, with brands like, um, Cartoon Network, uh, with Peanuts, with Garfield, it is about seeing like, how do we get out? into the widest circle possible and introduce people to the medium. 
And, um, you know, I think there are those opportunities at mass market, at Walmart, Target, Costco. They just have to be the right ones. And then the trick of it is how do you make the product compelling enough for those buyers to take a position on it without doing it at the expense of your your other customers? Right. Right. That that is that is the tricky part and I do think that there's a lot of interesting introductory products and a lot of it comes around that Amazon empire. It's like, you know, you read interviews with David Steinberger and he talks about uh, Comixology's David Steinberger and he talks about how Comixology Unlimited has led to significant gains for the publishers who participate. And, and 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 I think that stuff is interesting because they have that whole ecosystem of prime reading and Kindle Unlimited and et cetera, et cetera that introduces people can introduce people to the medium and then path them in a direction towards comicsology and then could path them even, f- I mean, not necessarily path them towards comic shops, but I remember when there was deep fear of digital as it, it was the great comic shop killer, it was the direct market killer, but now it's a lot of them have found that it's more additive than they expected. And I don't know, I mean, it, it there was a really interesting retailer piece amongst all of this by Menachem Lukens from Escape Pod Comics and TCJ in, in the Comics Journal. And he talked about basically what you're saying about how retailers have a tendency of being so focused on the, you know, the way things are and were that they stop thinking about the way that things should be and the way that the direction should go. And I I think ultimately it's got to be something complementary. There, there's no way we can't put that, you know, the genie back in that bottle, like digital comics are not going away. Like Raina Telgemeier readers are not necessarily going to become single issue X-Men readers or something like that. And so it's like finding a, the best way to service all these groups is really going to be one of the big questions for the next few years. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I think if we can solve those challenges constructively, it the the opportunity and the hope is for a a comic book marketplace that is bigger and um and and, and more successful than it is now, you know? And and ultimately I think that that has the possibility to create growth for people at every level. Um, and that, that's what we're always pursuing. Right. But like when I look at a, you know, a, a project like, um, Ben 10, you know, uh, that, that we're doing, uh, as graphic novels, the first place that a eight year old boy might discover that might be at a scholastic book fair, or it might be in his library or it might be at his school. It might not be in a comic shop, but my hope is if we've done our job correctly, you know, some percentage of those boys will become lifelong comic book readers Mm -hmm. or at least diehard comic book readers for a period of time. And, you know, if we do our job right, we can lead those potential customers to comic shops. Um, because ultimately I think the power of the direct market is, um, that, that community space that creates a sense of, um, not only belonging and a place where you can have conversations and, uh, discover things, but also a place where you're walking in and the person behind the counter is an expert who can make recommendations, who can, guide you uh, in in into whatever your next passion pro or passion um uh pursuit or obsession is going to be you know and and that's that is unique that's not a, a a thing that can be replicated at walmart for example yeah i do think one of the tricky things though and this is something i've heard from a lot of retailers is so many publishers focus on marketing to the the, the retailers themselves that it, they don't feel that publishers really advertise towards the end user they don't promote towards the people who might be excited with that and you know there's a lot of obviously somebody like you know a company like boom is is doing a lot on social and everything like that but still it's like in terms of actual i I, i've always pointed this out as a a big example it's like the new 52 i think a big part of the reason why it was such a, a huge hit wasn't because they relaunched the universe it was because the it was really like the first time in forever dc had actually advertised their comics towards a larger populace and like i had people friends and family who have no interest in comics ask me about it and they were just genuinely curious and it's 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 interesting it's because like ultimately a lot of your 
the, the biggest ROI from your marketing dollars often goes into promoting to those the existing marketplace. But is that a way yeah. to grow? I don't know. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right. I think that's the other byproduct of extending returnability is like it, it incentivizes publishers to push at, to push their sales and marketing dollars to uh, focus more on sell through, right? And um, and so we've definitely over the last uh, few years been focused on that, and that's why at Comics Pro, one of the things I called out for retailers is last year we we grew our social media footprint by forty seven percent. We we increased our engagement by two hundred thirty one percent, which is that's the more exciting statistic for me is we're reaching more of the people that are following us. We're engaging with them more deeply. And that's just the thing that we can immediately quantify. What I can't quantify is like the partnerships that we've done with fathom events, uh, on, on, uh, various, you know, when, when dark crystal came back in the theater, uh, promoting the graphic novels, uh, in the theaters on, you know, ahead of the, the film being shown, um, working with WWE to promote um, the the comic books and the graphic novels at WrestleMania last year. There are, there are things that you know, and and the tricky thing is always um, this is the probably one of the greatest challenges in terms of sell through that the direct market faces, which is um, it's a shotgun approach, right? So there's no you know once the books are ordered, I have no idea who has what and how many and where. Right. So it makes it difficult to promote. And, and sometimes, um, you know, you can hit the right audience and then they go into a comic shop and the book is not there. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that's that's a missed opportunity for everybody. So that's where trying to pair it, pair this with returnability. Um, I'm really excited about, you know, some of the upcoming point of sales solutions that that are uh, in their in their nascent stages, but starting to develop. We you know, one of the other. Uh, groups we were spending a lot of time with at uh, Comics Pro is this company Comics Hub that's mm-hmm. hopefully going to allow publishers to be able to track sell through more effectively and support retailers with you know for instance targeted social media advertising when we see that oh you know what um, Chicago is having trouble selling through once in future let's make sure we we make some noise in that area to, to alert, you know, wicked and divine fans that Kieran's got a new book coming out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, I met, I was actually at comics pros annual meeting last year in Portland and, and I met the, the gentleman who, who runs comics hub. And I remember that at that point he only had something like, he didn't have that many people signed up, but I think he's, yeah. up, when I, when I talked to Katie Proctor from books with pictures, I think she was something like his 90th account or something along those lines. And it's, so it's growing and growing. And I think they've been looking for a POS solution for a while, something that can, can do this. And I don't know I, I, I saw Ryan Higgins tweet something from comics conspiracy. He tweeted something about how like update your comic sub pull list. And I'm like, wow, I definitely cannot do that with the POS system. My, my shop is using. So that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. It'd be super exciting to be able to reach out to, uh, customers, uh, potential customers, fans of, of big properties and say, Hey, if you want to pre-order, uh, you know, the new Buffy number one, download this app and it'll, show you the closest store you can pre-order it on your phone and then you just show up at the store and pick it up when you're yeah, ready that, that, that's amazing i mean that that's the dream i have a lot of different directions i could go but the real i'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with one last question and it's it's about a personal favorite of mine okay i love giant days a lot of people love giant days when will that become the greatest and biggest hit in all of comics please tell me when <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I think it is uh, as close to a perfect comic as uh, I've ever had the, the pleasure of publishing. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, the thing I will say is that it is um, it is a bigger hit than people would think. Sure. And that is because its audience is uh, very well distributed. Right. So there are fans that buy the single issues in the direct market. There are a lot of fans that buy the collections uh, when they when they show up and you know, they go out to libraries and bookstores and all these other channels that we talked about. And there's there's a really 
it's one of our, our biggest digital series because John uh, Allison, who, who created and, and writes it, you know, started as a web cartoonist. So um, it, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think you <laughs> have the plan to make Giant Days uh, the biggest uh, comic in the industry because I think it certainly deserves it on, on, on merit. I think I read an interview with you uh, where you said something along the lines of it's like, it is a big hit, but it's like, it's tough to sell a comic that's about three British college students to like, you know, a, a massive comic book audience. At the same time, it is a shockingly relatable comic. I have never been a 20 something uh, British girl before, but there was so much in there. I'm just like, this is college. This is, this is just college. This is what my experience was like. And I love it. Yeah, I, I, I think I get the same feeling. I, I, I think you and I would agree that we're not necessarily uh, uh, the target audience for that book, but that's what makes it so brilliant is it, it is so universal. Um, and um, it is so hard to be that consistently funny Yeah, in comics, which I know is a weird thing to say, given that, you know, when you say the word comic to most people, they think comic strip. But the the way that John and Max use page turns and, um, you know, slapstick humor and visual gags and puns and wordplay and all this, you know, and just relationships. It's, um, it's one of my favorites. I know I shouldn't say I have favorites, but it, <laughs> I won't well, say it, it's, it's my favorite. I'll just say it's one of my favorites. How about that? I, I will say the, the secret sauce to, in my opinion, to John Allison's success. Cause I also like bad machinery and like the larger scary go round stuff is, is some of my, my favorite work of anybody's. He is, is a very funny writer, a very funny cartoonist, but he has the rare ability to blend absurdity and genuine human empathy into one large pot and in making it really, really work in a way that feels like life to the most greatest degree. And, and I think that's the reason why, you know, it speaks to everybody. I, I think that it truly is like a comic, but I mean, giant days in particular, it, it is a comic that is about life and turns out a whole lot of people have experience with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good pitch for giant days. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm here for. Uh, anyways, but, uh, Philip, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about, you know, the industry, direct market, giant days being the greatest comic ever. I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, it's, it's been my pleasure, David. This was really fun. Before we go, I want to give a special shout out to Sean Kirkham, AKA big clutch, one of off panels patrons and another edition of big clutches beast of the week, where I highlight a creator or comic that blew me away recently. This segment will sometimes feature guests and sometimes not. This week, it's just me, and I'm going to highlight Cemetery Beach from Warren Ellis, Jason Howard, and Phonographics. This image miniseries is about an agent from Earth trying to escape a secret off-world colony founded by humans 100 years ago that's filled with generations of lunatics is basically a seven-issue action sequence, but it's one filled with shocking humanity and biting humor. Howard's art is unreal throughout, with the bonkers action sequences and character bits working thanks to his brilliant art. It ended this past week, and man, I love the finale. It was a perfect conclusion to the series. So shout out to Cemetery Beach, this week's pick for Big Clutch's Beast of the Week. Look for this to close episodes, if not every week, then most every week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with Boom Studios President of Publishing and Marketing, Philip Sablik. You can find Philip on Twitter at, at Philip Sablik. If you're a fan of Off Panel, make sure to check it out on Patreon. If you back the show on there, you not only support it, but you get early access to each week's podcast, access to exclusive written and audio content, and more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Off Panel on iTunes or Stitcher and give the show a rating or review while you're at it. You can find Off Panel on social media by liking it on Facebook at slash sketched. That's S K T C H D. Following it on Twitter at, at @sketchcomic or following me at, at @slicefriedgold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Wesley Gift, Sean Kirkham, Harry Small, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Greg Peterson, Gus, Andrew Scott, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Johan Barander, Paul Reinwan, Connor Farner, Vita Ayala, JDC, and Matt Gagnon, Aditya Bidikar, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, Kieran Marc Antonio. 
WMQ Comics, Akil, Greg Lockard, Kokachi, Phil White, Ben Becker, Sean Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Philip Sebi, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, Nick Michelin, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Paletto, Owen McCready, Brendan Fletcher, Gary Maloney, Jonathan Nielsen, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogert, Xavier Files, Maria Schweitzer, Matthew Taylor, Tyler Turner, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Evan Blazer, Brian McRae, Ira James Udaskin, Modern Magic Stories, Nick Hall, Bruno Batista, Bobby Angus, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Phil Nall, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Benjamin Shipper, Colin McMahon, Chris Palmer, Maxwell Schmidt, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairbairn, Kat McKenzie, Lou Iovino, Nicholas Kesslake, Greg Rucka, Adam Highfield, Nicholas Gardner, Andrew Corrigan, Fiona Staples, Chris Morris, Chris O'Halloran, Mark Abbott, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim DiMonacos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to the band Wolfpack, whose excellent track outro from their album Volmilch opens the show. Give them a listen as they're totally rad. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode.